Hello and welcome to Paradigm Playbook, a podcast for entrepreneurs in the business of sports. Your hosts, Dave Kozak and Steve Cook, are business owners, successful entrepreneurs, sports enthusiasts, avid readers, and longtime friends. For years, they've read every business book on the market and built successful companies with what they've learned. This podcast will give you the critical takeaways in just 15 minutes a week. It's a quick and easy playbook for building a winning sports business. And now, here are your hosts, Dave and Steve. Know someone who could benefit from our business expertise? Send them our way. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Paradigm Playbooks Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Kozak, alongside my co-host, Mr. Steve Cook. Good morning, David. I'm looking forward to this one. It is a good morning. So, Steve, we've had several conversations uh, in between our recordings on business matters and our consulting work and what we're doing with other companies. And a topic's come up that makes me want to sort of shift gears for a minute. We've been talking a lot about marketing recently, and I think there's some tie-in here uh, to the overall marketing, uh, but it's the scalability, the growth. And, you know, there was a concept that was taught I, I mean, probably college at this point called a SWOT analysis, right? Which mm-hmm. is when you evaluate the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats to your business. And, and you can do it specific to marketing. You can do it specific to business operations. You can really do it according to anything, right? So I, I, I think it comes in as a pre-decision making exercise that yeah. helps you make that decision. So I, I, think it, I think it's a good process. Yeah, it's absolutely a good process. And it's one I think people don't do enough. But some of the opportunities that this podcast and our consulting work have presented us have led us down the conversation of opportunities and trying to balance your time spent and the opportunity available and it and it made us talk yesterday in our in our meeting with the uh, consulting client about the how you evaluate opportunities and how you create opportunities, right? And I think it's something that needs to be discussed in this arena in small business because first and foremost, right? Opportunities don't just present themselves. Well, maybe it takes a special talent to recognize opportunity and they do present themselves. Uh, Yeah, I think they, they do definitely, but I think recognition is huge. And it's a skill. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And and but but I also think there's a there's a component of it that you know we we've talked in previous podcasts uh, relating to sports going into business with your eyes up, right? We talked about yeah. I think I related it to football. They talk about having your eyes up all the time in football, so you know where where, where the play's developing and who's got the ball. Well, in business, if you go in eyes up and you're paying attention. And you're doing things on purpose with all the decision making stuff that we've taught, with all of the planning stuff that we've discussed, right? Opportunities are everywhere. And I think the the key is to recognize opportunity. And I think the harder part, Steve, is once you learn how to recognize opportunity, it's knowing which opportunities to take advantage of and which ones to walk away from and, and how to go through that decision process. So I think, and, and this is something that I've learned from you and it's a, I'm in the process of writing this book and I just got through this, the chapter on, on vision and actually seeing your vision. So opportunities will come up all the time that will, you know, help you enhance your vision, get you closer to your vision. Yeah. Opportunities will also show up that will distract you from your vision and pull you in a different direction. And I'm proud and ashamed <laughs> to say that I've been victim of both. I, you know, I'm, you know, I'll give you a quick story. I'm running a rep agency years ago in the sporting goods industry. And one thing led to another. I, I kind of picked up a line that crossed from athletic footwear to beachwear. And then that offered me an opportunity to go into another beachwear line. And the next thing you know, I am have a rep agency in an entirely different industry than I was in. And it took a long time before I pulled that back on track. And it wasn't that it wasn't good business. It wasn't my vision. That's not where I wanted to go. 
So it, it pulled me in another direction. And I think one of the things that happens all the time, opportunities, if only weighed financially, mm-hmm. can pull you in a different direction. And I think that's a huge, huge thing to recognize. Um, and I'm reminded of an old fable uh, from my childhood, and I think everybody's childhood, the tortoise and the hare. And what opportunities with pure financial gain offer is oftentimes the hare version. Right? You may be able to get there faster, uh, but will it be a long and successful model? Right? Um, imagine this. You're, you're going down a pathway. You have this vision, and this opportunity presents itself. But this opportunity really creates a, a fork in the road for the vision. And to, to you know, 10 years down the road, uh, imagine you know, you're on a boat and you set the autopilot on the compass to you know, 290 degrees. And it's off one degree, but you go down that, you go that direction for days on end. How far off of the vision are you when you get there? And so I think you have to really, you have to take your time, right? This is the, this is the, I call it the working on it room. And we used to always, always talk in the, in the past um, where we were contracted with different insurance carriers or financial institutions. And we would get this answer when we asked questions, well, we're working on it. And we always used to laugh. The working on a room must be huge because they seem to be working on everything and, mm-hmm. and nothing's getting to the finish line. So where what I like to do when presented this stuff is I really have to go back to the basics. What is the outcome that it presents? What does done look like? Right? Go back to Stephen Covey's begin with the end in mind. Those opportunities present themselves. Okay. It, it sounds like a good opportunity. It sounds like a, what is the, what does the end of it look like? And is it something that I'm going to spend the next 90 days, one year, five years, 10 years pursuing? And is it when I end up at that outcome, is it what I wanted? Yeah. And again, it, it's pulling you off your vision. But if you, if you don't start with a vision, mm-hmm. if you just start into a business and then let it take you, you know, whichever way, you may go all the way down that, you know, your boat or, I think Stephen Covey did this story with an airplane fly, flying from LA to New York, you know, and off one degree ends up in Baltimore or whatever yeah. the deal was. But I, I think if you let that happen, it can. There was a um, a quote in the book. Um, help me with the author. Unreasonable hospitality. Who's the author? Oh, you're putting me on the spot. I'll think you of just it. read it. I think. Garda Garda G R Gallarda Will Gallarda Gallarda. I think. Uh, okay. So he has a statement in there that says, you know, slow down so you can speed up. Yeah. And so, you know, and it, it's one of the, you know, every book you get, there's a couple of things in there that Nuggets. you'll always go back to, like you always go back to Stephen Covey. But in this, I thought, you know, slow down so you can speed up. So to accelerate your growth, sometimes you got to, you know, take one step back and, you know. Or, you know, take a shuffle step or a, you know, a crossover or, or whatever it's going to take to get you where you're going. Well, and I, and I don't, I don't want anybody to take this podcast as though the vision day one is the vision year 10 is the vision year 15 is the vision year 20. That is not your vision develops and matures as you mature as a business owner. That, that is a hundred percent fact. Very few companies start with the perfect vision and, and, Exactly as it was laid out for them, right? Because you, you you've got to you, sometimes you got to be like water, right? Back to the old Bruce Lee quote: "You've got to be like water and go sometimes where it takes you." But but, the, but you have to be aware of it, though. Hundred percent. I, I think you know, and, and you make a critical decision. Like yeah, you got to decide. Right. My vision is modified. My vision is changing. My so, vision is developing. So I think okay. So let's take it. You're heading in this direction, and we'll take my rep agency. And I come up with this opportunity to go in a little diff- different direction, you know, men's activewear or wherever yeah. I was going. And if I can, you know, say, okay, yeah, well, that's a bigger market. Maybe that is where I want to go. But to go there and not realize you're coming off of this, I think that's a mistake. So another, you know, term that we hear all the time is intentionality. Yeah. And so if you intentionally follow that opportunity, which maybe is why you have to slow down and give it a little bit more, um, more thought before you just jump at everything. 
Um, and like, I'm definitely, you know, a, a ready fire aim guy, you know, that that's well, and, how and, I and from entrepreneurs and to yeah. some extent have to be right. Ready to jump. But the, the older you get, the more you do it. And now as we're consulting with clients, I'm working on a large facility, you know, in the Western United States and they have opportunity to add, you know, a swim school. They have opportunity to add dance school. I said, okay, we've got to, you know, they may be great opportunities, but let's think this all through. How do these pieces fit? Yeah. And I'm, I have three uh, consulting clients right now that are in the financial services arena, all wanting to figure out how to do a, a specific piece of it. And the, the one major thing they all have in common is their own financial services. But the business models couldn't be more different mm -hmm. from one another. They're, they're special specialities and things like that. So you, you've got to, you got to think the old bolt on versus the new versus a whole new infrastructure. And you, you've got to be able to, to balance that. And so a lot of times when I'm evaluating opportunities and to go back to the beginning where I started, right? I had the business model was laid out for me. It was sort of presented. I invested and then built and then sold and then recreated it the way I wanted to do it in my own. And that was a, that was a tough decision to make mm -hmm. to, to take a step back from something that was built and, and recreate it differently. So it was a better business model. That's that slow down, take a step backwards yeah. before I can move forward. Um, but every opportunity that's presented itself to me since, or every opportunity, I shouldn't say presented itself, every opportunity that I've gone after was in some way a parallel to what I was already doing. It was something that I could do that was an additional a, a model, an additional build on to the overall corporation. And so I've had lots of opportunities to do things that were not in my, that, that were not necessarily connected which when they presented themselves, they were financially, they were amazing looking. Uh, but time-wise, I, I just couldn't commit to the amount of time it would take to do that and continue the vision of the original companies that I had. Now, I think some of that was age and build related. Some of that is, well, once I get these pieces built, will I go back and reconsider some of those opportunities? Um, but sometimes you got to, you know, the old... <clears throat> Know when to hold them, fold them, walk away, and run. The uh, let's let's just slow down to speed up here. Let, let's back up and differentiate between growth, expansion, scaling, because I, I think there's different things you can do with a business. And if you're looking for, you know, eight to ten percent growth, you know, or um, you know, two to three percent increase in profitability, you know, those are growth metrics. That, that are all good and you can intentionally go after those. Mm -hmm. If you want to go, you know, take your business from a million dollar business to a $10 million business, you know, that's called scaling and it takes, you know, a, def, a definitely different mindset to go into scaling your business than to growing your business. And then, you know, and what I'm dealing with now in the sports world is because sports are so popular. I mean, the private sports facility has never been a hotter market than right now. So they're all looking at, at growth opportunities or expansion opportunities. And in most minds, expansion means more space for more kids. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where they're going. But scaling is totally different. And I think it's often confused. Yeah. I mean, so you have internal scale, external scale, you have mergers and acquisitions, you have additional facilities, you have additional space, you have it, this, and this is where it, it stems back over to marketing crossover and market research and the clientele potential. And so I think the, I think there's something else that has to be at the root of this, which is the entrepreneur's desire and knowing you know, at least having an idea of what you're getting into, right? If you go for scale, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, I don't know how many businesses I've, I've worked with that, you know, there's an owner, there's three trucks, there's a good reputation and a good business model, profitable. And that's, that's, that's it. That's where they want to be. They don't want 
to take that step. And I've, I've had the conversation. I have a couple that are um, sort of on the line of if I go, if I take that next step to scale, they're a little bit scared of it. They don't know that they want to manage it. They don't know that they want that type of pressure. They don't know that they want to scale it out. So I think the, the starting point for this as a business owner is, is are you, are you in for that ride? Right. And at what point do you say enough's enough? I'm good. Uh, because sometimes, Steve, once you get the snowball rolling, it keeps rolling. Thank you for listening. Visit paradigmplaybook.com to discover how we can support you and your business. Oh, yeah. And I, I think that becomes a real problem. And so you have, you know, business partners that are telling you one thing, you have family members telling you something totally different. And you're saying all I want is balance in my life. Well, if you're an entrepreneur <laughs> scaling a business, you don't have balance. And I'm, I'm not criticizing anyone, but to think that, that you're, you're going to work nine to five and scale a business in finances or sports world or any, any business, it's just not going to happen. doesn't mean you're a bad person. And I don't like the term workaholic. I, you know, I detest the people that kind of look down their nose at, at people that are just working hard. But you have to make that an intentional decision that I'm going to go into this life. And, you know, you start out, you own one restaurant and, and I think in the e-myth, they talk about the, it was a donut shop or something where you're making donuts, you're happy, you love making donuts, you see the smile on people's faces. The next thing you're in the, in the back room doing the books, the next thing you do, you're buying trucks and, and moving things around and you haven't had a donut in like you know, yeah. <laughs> years and years. And you're out of that world and there's nothing wrong with that. No, not if at all. If it's intentional. Correct. Um, you know, the, so scaling in its own right, you talked about the mindset of scaling and there's, and then there's the mindset of profitability, right? And they're not necessarily the same thing because you can, you can scale out at the same exact profit margin, right? So Let's say you had a store. I don't care if it sells widgets, it does gymnastics, it sells insurance, it doesn't matter. That one store has a you know quarter million dollar profit. You can duplicate a second store and potentially make another quarter million dollar profit. However, do you have the identical management structure? Do you have the same people? Do you have the same and can you can't have two people in the same place at the same time, right? So what made this one profitable and can you duplicate that elsewhere, right? You talk about, we talk about franchises all the time because franchises are constantly looking for entrepreneurs. They're constantly trying to set you up for success, but you can have two franchises that bought the same exact model. One does incredibly well and one does very poorly, right? And what's the differentiating factor there? Is it the management? Is it the knowledge? Is it what, what, what causes that? Well, the, the thought is internally, whatever it is that causes one to be better, it's not the system. So that, that's where the franchise locks in and they do offer something. So if with a franchise, you're not getting the system, you're not getting the curriculum, you're not getting you know, the, the group marketing, you're not getting those things, then there's very little advantage to it. And there are some detriments. Now, if you expand not by franchising, but by duplication, mm -hmm. which is different, then you have the problem of if you're the driving force in site A and you want to duplicate that, I have to understand that at best, site B only gets 50% of what site A got and site A is losing a little something. Yeah. So it's that duplication, that training that everybody's got to look to. And if, if we want to go to a growth model that's a little bit different, if you're, if you've got, you know, selling, you know, a million dollar business selling men's suits, mm -hmm. you know, you can open up a second one and sell men's suits. And if your average, average suit is $300 or whatever, you know, you, you can scale that way, or you can scale by switching it from $300 suits to, you know, thousand dollar suits and going after a different market and still scale the same business. You're still selling suits. It's still built on customer relationships and all that. But so you can scale in many different ways. I think one of the issues that we have in sports is 
we have people trying to scale in all those ways. And, and I don't really think it's scaling. One's growth. You know, to me, 10%, 10%, 10% is growth. 10x your business is scaling. That's kind of how I look at it. And yep. I think the book 10x, that's how whoever, is that, was that Grant Cardone or? Hey, Cardone or Hardy or. Yeah, one of those guys. One, one of them. But, um, but, but that's a totally different process. And I think what I'm dealing with is more growth or expansion. What you're dealing with in the financial world probably is closer to scaling. Yeah, absolutely it is. And, and I made that decision. Mm-hmm. So I grew to where I felt it was manageable, repeatable, high quality customer service and, and driven results. The, there was, there's an old military uh, chain of command document and, and I could produce it, I'd, I'd have to find it, but it, it, the study of the military was that any one person can really handle six to eight direct reports. Once you get above that, you, you run you, you, the Peter principle, right? You rise to your level of incompetence. You can't do everything. And so this goes back to infrastructure, corporate structure, whether it's a, a matrix or whether it's a hierarchy, however you do it, there has to be some next level management that comes into play, right? And so for me, it was, okay, I've got my shop in a very good sort of capacity that I can manage. Can I now take other shops and get them that level, which is where the consulting comes in. And it's like, okay, let me show you how to get to where I am. And by doing that, I'm now expanding and trying to 10X my business in that regard. So I could go recruit advisor after advisor after advisor to work for me. And instead I'm going to the advisors and letting teaching them how to recruit and being part of their scale, which in turn scales mine. And and somebody has to take the role of entrepreneur in every business. And I maintain that in the corporate world, the 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 large corporations that fail that you see you know, stagnate or go backwards are the ones that lose their entrepreneurial push because of duplication. And they, because that entrepreneurial spirit, the passion, you know, all that that's there is hard to intentionally duplicate. You know, you have to get it through. So it's what they, in, in, you know, I'm stuck on this book, uh, intention, uh, unreasonable Unreasonable hospitality. hospitality. I'm stuck on this because what you have to do is you have to build the culture that will will go with you when you open that second store, the second restaurant or or whatever and and they talk about you know how you know cult is short for culture and how you know that's going to be what people remember. So if you're expanding or growing to a second facility how do you move that culture that's the most important thing the rest of it assuming you have it in place your processes will move automatically the the culture is not automatic no and and if you go back to some of our early podcasts i uh, i preached about culture as much as i possibly could one of the hardest things I think as a leader to do is to constantly instill the culture that you want because it it's not it doesn't just happen day one and once you've established the culture you want, it doesn't just maintain because it maintains. It's a constant effort to have that culture. And it's a it's a top down effect, right? If the leadership at the top loses its idea of culture, then the rank and file also lose their culture, right? True, but if if you can maintain that culture and the culture starts with how you treat your employees, your staff first, then that's going to spread to your customers and that's how, you know, Seth Godin would say you're building a tribe and your tribe is only so big. You talk about six reports or you know, I kind of feel that way about meetings. You know, when the the tenth person walks into a meeting, I'm kind of like I'm I'm out because you don't have time for ten people to talk, and if you're not contributing, you know, why are you there? We don't need spectators in the meeting. But to grow, you're going to have to move that core culture 
to the next area, the next department. So if you're running a sport and you, you know, and I face this right now with, you know, we have a culture within our baseball academy of how we coach and, and, you know, it's very, very much hands-on and, and very close knit. We know our kids really, really well. And then I'm trying to say, okay, how can that culture move over to cricket? Cricket is totally different. It comes from a different base. They're looking at it differently. They don't want to share. They don't have the experience. They're not playing as many games. They don't get results. So it doesn't necessarily move over there. Now, I don't know if that's true in the financial world. If, if you're, let's say you're selling auto insurance and now you say, okay, I'm going to add homeowners or I'm going to sell you know, business product liability or, or any other, if it takes a different culture to sell to those markets. I don't know. It certainly does. And uh-huh. it, it and and it's a it's a well one one is more commoditized right so you're selling widgets and the next one is more customized so you're okay, you're selling yeah. relationships and so you know now I would argue that a good a good commodity sales or relationship sale at the same time if you can get it there but it oftentimes you know fifteen minutes can save you fifteen percent or less on car insurance right <laughs> or fifteen percent or more on car insurance the world knows that yeah. or thinks that at least in the business world. And I'll say the other, this is a cool distinction to make on, on your, your personal lines, home and auto insurance, everything is sort of added. And if you Mm -hmm. want something removed, you remove it on the commercial world. Everything is removed. And if you want something, you add it. So it's a, it's a, it's a different expertise and it's a different relationship. So culturally you have to, you got to buff the relationship side more so than you do the volume side. It's interesting. I'm having a kind of a crossover moment, you know, where my, my world is crossing with yours in working with some of these facilities. And when you cross from athletic instruction, sports instruction to a pay for play model, you flip the insurance model and it's, it's totally the opposite. So we go in and, and, you know, the facility is playing, paying so much ahead. You run 500 kids through, you're paying so much ahead. When you go over into the play for play, the recreational side of it, that's all, that model is all based on revenues driven and you're paying based on a percentage of revenues in there. So it totally flips and you think, oh, geez, I'm just starting this up. Well, then you're going to have to project revenues. So the details that come with growth, you know, it's not logical. And I, you know, with my business at Grand Slam, we found this out early on in that we were in, in the middle of um, pay for play and instruction, instructional sports, and we we're able to get that modeled. But it, it's not that easy. So I think some of the growth transitions aren't um, intuitive. I mean, you, you really need to think them through. Well, and that's why when, when we talk about growth scaling, and and again, we've distinguished the two, right? That's where you really have to jump into working on the business, understanding the business structure model and what you're what you're actually providing. You can't just be the best coach anymore. You've got to be a very good business owner, and you can't just be the best salesperson anymore. You've got to be a business owner, and and that that shift takes time. And I think that goes to back to the original when you talk about that vision that you're working towards. Mm-hmm. How do you see yourself? Remember when we created this this uh, paradigm playbook consulting organization? The idea was the 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 coach in the in the uh, short sleeve shirt with the logo on and the whistle hanging from the neck leaves our world in a suit with a whistle, you know, and so still can do that, but now has the expertise in the business side. So um, a lot of scaling comes down to understanding. The business aspect of it. And I think, um, yeah, and maybe this was intentional that, you know, the model of paradigm playbook is, you know, the model of my life. And that, I mean, I made that, I had the whistle around my neck. I was passionate about coaching and now I'm saying, you know, yeah, I really don't care about his curveball. <laughs> What's the return on square foot? Yeah, you know? well. So I, I've made that flip and you have to keep that calm. But I think every business should be intentional about growth. Not every business needs to scale or can scale. Without question. Okay, so 100%. I think the growth component 
and we can dig into, you know, we've, we've been this a million ways and it, it takes you back to the marketing so you can grow by changing your effective marketing. You can grow by changing your financial models and, or your cost structures or your price schedule or your customer base. All those things are growth uh, strategies where scaling is a total different mindset. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've been all over the place today. <laughs> yeah, but, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's it all good fun, stuff. Yeah. And I think, you know, the moral of it is go in eyes up and evaluate all the opportunities that come at you and, and make, um, be purposeful about the choices that you do make. Yeah. And before we sign off, I, I just want to encourage anybody who's listening to this that has an idea. And I had one um, last week that came up and said, why don't you guys ever talk about? So if there's something that you, you want to say, guy, you know what? You got to dig deeper into sales. And no one's ever going to say that no. to me, are they? But, um, but if there is a component of business understanding that we're dealing with, you know, all levels of business, and if it if it works for the the whole crowd, we're happy to discuss it. And if it's something that we're not familiar with, you know, maybe you're the one that needs to come in and and help discuss it with us. Absolutely. If you enjoy the episode and the podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. Everyone, make it a great day. Do you want your business to thrive? Visit us at paradigmplaybook.com and contact us today for expert assistance.